Happy holidays everybody. I have uh, gotten a special outfit for uh, today's video. In case you're wondering how I got this uh, Mickey Mouse t-shirt. Better don't ask, okay? So, uh, what we're gonna be doing today basically, I'm gonna be walking you through four model games that uh, I have played using the Karokan. You can pretty much think of it uh, as an uh, IKEA tour in a way that at the end of the video, you will know uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, I'm talking about the essentials, okay? We're gonna be going over the classical variation, the exchange, the advance, and uh, who knows? Maybe I'm even uh, gonna buy you a meal from the IKEA restaurant if you watch it till the end. Welcome everybody, managed to find another black game. Gonna be going for the Caro and uh, curious to see what chess.com universe is gonna bring us uh, in another game. And apparently we do get served uh, the Christmas Eve two nights. There's many ways that uh, you can actually play against the two nights. Bishop g4 is very common. d4 may seem very tempting, but I don't think it's a great move, simply because uh, well, I can read out the knights and then bishop c4, and then uh, I don't think you can really make uh, that much use of uh, the pawn center, let's say. But uh, overall, my favorite approach is to actually go for the D takes on E4 and not follow it up how most people would be mistakenly playing Bishop G4 just because they're kind of in love with the pins. Nor Bishop F5 just because they're used to attack the knight and develop, thinking that's good. But to play Knight F6 instead, which is pretty much a silent invitation to take and transpose back into the Tarta cover, which we actually love to play against the classical variation. So the classical variation, for those of you that are a little bit confused, it usually starts at the d4, d5, knight c3. It is one of the most popular ways for white to play where I recommend you take, and then you play knight f6, pretty much uh, reaching the same position that uh, we did in the game. This way, making uh, it possible to only learn one variation against both the two knights and also uh, against the classical variation. Which, hey, if the Karokan wasn't uh, easy enough already, there is that. Alternatively, once, uh, let's say, you cross 2000 ELO, they may start playing Queen E2 occasionally, but it's still very rare. That is the main move nowadays. Pony please bishop c4. I'm gonna go bishop d6. Idea is to get castled as soon as you can. You don't wanna rush for bishop g4 because uh, he can start checking you and already it's a little bit awkward. So you wanna get castled. And then you get the pin. Okay, you're getting the pin. And pretty much the rule that I want you to remember, okay, there's actually a rule for every variation in the Karokan, whether you are dealing with the advance, with the exchange, uh, or with the Tartakover. Whenever you got these double pawns and you are dealing with h3, you always want to keep the bishop. You always want to keep the pin. Okay? Now, as a rule of thumb, rook onto the open file, with one move, you're genuinely controlling seven squares. That is pretty dope. So we're going to prioritize that. And next step is to finish development. You want to develop your knight. So knight goes to d7 simply out of uh, having other squares. Uh, you got to get comfortable developing knight to d7. Typical mistake that uh, a lot of beginners make just because they are, uh, you know, in their brain, it's somehow like the knight can only develop on c6. So they start randomly pushing c5. There's no need for that. Knight to d7. Now, after knight to d7, there's pretty much uh, many ways to continue. But the easiest and the most efficient one, in my opinion, is to simply park the knight on f8. Okay? You just park it there. Like, literally. You know, like having those kind of neighbors uh, that have, uh, let's say, a car, and they never really move it for, like, years. Can actually be the situation like that with the knight, okay? You never know when you need a car to rush somewhere. It's not like you can get a taxi and be there immediately, right? You need to occupy, like, <laughs> the whole uh, 
place around with cars that you never move. I'm just uh, exaggerating a little bit because this is the current situation uh, in Bucharest. So, uh, night of eight. Jokes aside, it is a very uh, useful night to have and uh, it can usually be maneuvered via E6 to F4 or G6 F4. The only thing that you want to watch out for is not to get your bishop trapped. So be careful. Okay, opponent plays knight H4, which uh, actually seems to be quite a common motif that they uh, move the knight away, creating pressure. We can trade, trading is fine, we can also keep. However, giving up the bishop pair, although fine, I'm not super sure about. Like, the only argument uh, for this would be that after knight g6, knight f5 looks a little bit annoying. It's not very easy to get rid of it. So I'm just going to keep the bishop simply because of the fact that uh, I feel like his knight could try to infiltrate. And even though... I would love to get the pawn cube. I think taking with the knight is a little bit better in this position. Just because uh, it's prioritizing, let's say, f5, f4. It's threatening knight f4. So I'm going to go for activity here. I'm sorry, guys. I told you like multiple times the pawn cube is a free win. I would really love to play it. Do I have to? <laughs> I feel like it's, uh, you know, I cannot really betray you on Christmas Eve like that. So I'm just going to go for the pawn cube regardless. But hey, taking with the knight is definitely a very solid option. And okay. What you pretty much need to understand in a nutshell about uh, this pawn structure, say like this, when you have double pawns. Okay. Why are the double pawns good? I mean, at the end of the day... White is just better with this 4 against 3 majority. They pretty much win all the end games. Okay, I will attach a picture on the screen with their dream scenario. Okay, if they can get into the king and pawn end game, you lose instantly. So in order to actually get compensation for, let's say, the deteriorated pawn structure, you want to attack white's king. This is pretty much the only variation in the Karokan when we, where we genuinely play for a kingside attack. And you can do so by setting up the sniper. Okay, bishop to c7, the start of a brilliant maneuver. Okay, first of all, you don't want to be hanging rooks. Or actually, actually, see, I was about to autopilot. I was about to autopilot and just play 96, but... Let's try to dive a little bit deeper uh, and calculate down the rabbit hole. Queen d6. Okay, bishop takes on f7. King moves. And threat is to go queen h2 and mate. Okay, that's pretty much mate, it looks like. So he cannot take the rook. But he plays g3. Now, in that position, black may have a winning move. Okay. Should we go queen d6? Do you find a winning move or should we just play it simple? Okay, if you play it simple, knight e6, queen d6, it's like completely okay. You're getting a position, but I think this is one of those positions where, uh, you know, it feels like uh, opponent can take on f7, but it's like literally the Trojan uh, horse story. Okay, it just feels like, uh, okay, you give, uh, you give up the Trojan rook here, like a gift, but uh, he's gonna be... Uh... <laughs> There's going to be a little bit of something uh, hiding inside the rook, okay? A little bit of a surprise for my opponent. And uh, yeah, I think he's going to be taking, or he's going to be playing g3. One of these two. Then it is still uh, your task to find uh, the winning blow, because it's actually funny. I was talking with uh, one of my students the other day, and I think the conversation started something like this. So he was asking me, okay, dude, I'm like, Getting this position, I like get developed like in the videos. How the heck do we get an attack? Well, <laughs> we literally had this position on the board and I was like, okay, you can just play a winning move here. And that really, you know, felt uh, a little bit like, uh, you know, an epiphany moment, like finding out the water is wet. Okay, can I actually like win here? Yes, you can. Yes, you can win after G3 if you get the correct timing on this. By playing rook takes on e3, 
which is going to be genuinely leading to a checkmate. <laughs> Thus, my opponent didn't even want to play through the variation and resigned. Since Fe would have allowed Queen G3 and then would have allowed checkmate in one. Remember the sniper. And remember that I told you the most important concept. Okay, how do you compensate for bad pawns? You have to attack the enemy king. Otherwise, you just pretty much, uh, okay, on a large sample, you will lose in the long run if you don't play for attack. Uh, and okay, you just go for the end games. White is always better. Now, this is hilarious because it looks like we're just making horrific blunder. I think H7 or H8, it didn't really matter there. But yeah, like, uh, the only move in this position not to lose for him, important idea, F4 leaves the bishop undefended, but I think he had to move the rook somewhere. But I couldn't really evaluate how the upcoming positions are. Like, I felt we should be fine. Yeah, computer likes something like this, and then rook E4, it seems. And okay, you can do check, and then queen G2. It's still kind of messy, but... Yeah, I'm curious if computer prefers knight e6 or queen d6 in that position. Yeah, so queen d6 was top line, as you can see, just pretty much faking a blunder. This is ridiculous. And you saw even I was like one second away to just play. Okay, f fuck it, we have to play knight e6. Also, by the way, <laughs> very funny idea that I have just noticed. We could have played rook e7 as well, wasn't terrible either. It was, you know, defending and setting up a trap. Because if queen takes on b7, you pause the video and you tell me the winning move. So we can go bishop to h2. Little bit of a, uh, you know, unwanted delivery. We get a discovery. Bishop to h2, pretty much uh, giving my opponent the poison pizza. And he has to pretty much take it because it's free pizza. And who doesn't like that? But then you find out you no know, more have a queen. Which is a bad thing to find out on Christmas uh, Day, especially. But yeah, Queen E6 did the job. Best move according to the engine, so who am I to argue with it? And uh, yeah, I think with that being said, we can pretty much just move on to the following game. But before we do that, I got a big announcement uh, to make, even though I may sound a little bit like that friend who is only calling when he needs to borrow some money or his girlfriend is mad at him. Currently, the Chisabella Awards uh, for uh, course of the year are running. Uh, in case you own uh, my uh, Karo Khan course, I need you to uh, use the link that I will uh, put in the pinned uh, comment of this video. Log in to your Gmail and then scroll down all the way to the bottom when you reach this section and I really need your vote, okay? In a democratic world, we cannot uh, let Gordon just win them all. I mean, just look at the art difference. It is not fair. It is not a fair game. I need your help, guys. Thanks a lot for that and uh, let's move on to the next game. All right, all right, all right. Managed to find another black game. I'm gonna be going for the Karo. And are we gonna get to face anything other than the Hillbilly attack? I mean, we are playing 1700 rated games after all. Put a place Knight F3. And this will pretty much, uh, yeah, just uh, dive back uh, onto the street of the exchange variation, which is actually famously starting uh, via this move order. And then takes, but uh, because opponents are like really clueless uh, in general, uh, they play this kind of weird move order. Um, it is going to be the same, which is kind of like the nice thing about this opening. Unlike, let's say, uh, when you are trying to learn uh, the Sicilian or any other opening, even against the weird nonsense, it usually tends to transpose uh, back to the normal kind of stuff that, uh, let's say, you can learn from the main lines. So, uh, keep that in mind, and um, we're going to be de developing the following way against uh, exchange, pretty much uh, developing knights on their natural squares and uh, bishop out uh, onto g4, the other bishop usually to e7. Typical beginner mistake. Bishop g4 is just a little bit too early, okay? It's just, um, you're going for the pin, allowing h3, and do you already know that you want to go bishop takes on f3, give up the bishop pair? 
because if you keep uh, g4, bishop g6, 95, let me tell you the bad news. White is much better with ideas such as h4, h5, and bishop to b5 check on the agenda. So uh, knight c6 first is better. And, uh, well, I'm going to start with a knight. Okay, you can start with a bishop now too. Just remember knights on the natural squares and then bishop g4. If they play h3, I'm going to play bishop f5. Um, that is fine as well. Ideally, I'm trying to make bishop g4 work. If that is not a thing, I'm going to go bishop f5. And okay, he's playing an interesting 95. This is not a bad move. It may look very silly just because he is moving uh, the same piece twice, which is not really advisable in the opening. But taking gives him a very annoying idea against my knight. So for that reason, uh, yeah, we may want to consider uh, bishop to f5. But as a matter of fact, I know bishop to b5 is quite annoying. So, quite a nice uh, idea in these type of positions could be to simply play uh, a6, which is a weird move at first, but it's actually meant to, uh, uh, well, just stop bishop to b5, which is genuinely just trying to fight uh, for your bishop pair, which is like, honestly, not a disaster, but it's kind of how the variation goes. Um... Yeah, I think I'm just going to go a6 because uh, it's sort of an easy way to deal with this. Pretty much uh, not uh, playing for uh, heavy theoretical debates. And then uh, notice that, uh, well, opponent played it in such a way that uh, we don't have a good square for the bishop. Well, against this line, it is quite interesting to go for g6. And I think you have two ways of playing it. Pretty much the old school way uh, is to go bishop g7 castle. But you can also consider bishop to f5 as an option, okay, just to get that trade in. Uh, I think normally it's more common that people just play bishop g7 castle and uh, later on try to fight for this knight, maybe knight d7. That can definitely be playable. But it goes for a prematurely release of tension to say the least, by taking. Which, yeah, he didn't have to do. And this kind of goes to show sort of typical mistake. Even for like 1700 rated players, they just make uh, concessions, okay? He had a strong knight. He no longer has. <laughs> because he was like, why not? <laughs> so uh, it is pretty much as deep as the explanation can go. I hope uh, you're satisfied by that. So uh, I would really love to throw in queen c7. It's sure you want to complete your fianchero and develop. But if you ask yourself, OK, where this bishop uh, can go, what could be an active square? Usually it's f4, just kind of occupying a lot of squares. So queen to c7 not only taking advantage of his somewhat weird f3 move that's kind of weakening uh, the diagonal and some data squares, but also giving this bishop like really a hard time fighting uh, like a good uh, good place. And uh, yeah, just kind of like a nice little move or the trick, uh, which uh, makes life a bit difficult for our opponent. And then, okay, we can finish uh, Fianchero. You can castle. Okay, he's going for knight c5, which is actually quite clever. The only problem with knight c5 is that we can sort of easily get rid of it by playing knight d7. So notice how many moves uh, the knight spent. Just so we can, uh, yeah, <laughs> take care of it uh, in one move. Uh, yeah, that's just... Uh, Pretty much showing uh, a not very effective strategy by my opponent, who has literally moved that knight a million times by now. It's just really making me mad because uh, he's breaking opening principles. And we already castled. And okay, this gets us to like a very thematic and typical situation where uh, we have a small lead in development. How do we really take advantage of that since... If you're not taking uh, the time and uh, opportunity right now, this leading development will pretty much evaporate, okay? It's like a dynamic advantage. You have to make use of it now. And okay, if you've been already uh, like uh, pretty 
regular viewer of the channel, you may be familiar with the concept of whenever your opponent's king is uh, in the middle, you can usually take advantage of that by opening up the center. So opening up the center can be done, uh, you know, in like the most obvious way by pushing e5, threatening to take on d4 twice, and I expect d e, and then uh, maybe knight e5 or queen e5 check. But it can also be done uh, with c5, simultaneously creating a threat of takes, and after takes, 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 that's a lot of takes, <laughs> the queen stops him from castling, because it controls the g1 square, but I'm going to go for like the most standard possible way. E5, remember, if there's anything you're going to be taking away from this video that's going to help out, uh, help you out throughout your whole chess career, I'm like really meaning that, is whenever your opponent is uh, sort of, uh, your opponent's king is sort of stuck in the middle, you want to open up the position, okay? Mark my words. All right, we have bishop to e3. Okay, Alex Manzia, yeah, but open up the position. How is this gonna ever help us win more games? Well, you can play e takes on e4. And then the rook is able to infiltrate, immediately asking some very awkward questions um, to that, uh, you know, to that king. You know, just uh, like uh, imagine <laughs> uh, your cop, uh, I mean, not your cop, I mean, <laughs> who has uh, his own cop? I mean, that would, uh, uh, you know. Having your own police officer really requires uh, some uh, next level uh, importance of a person. But imagine you get pulled up by a cop and he's asking you, okay, why do you wear, uh, you know, your underwear uh, on top of your pants? That is pretty awkward to answer. Similarly, how is he dealing with his pin? Because imagine he just defends, okay, like queen detail. Now, you pause the video. Yes, that's right, you, I'm talking to you and find the winning move, find a typical way to exploit the pin. Because you can genuinely just, uh, okay, increase the pressure on the pin piece. Bishop h6, or taking the free pawn, or queen f4. Every single one of these moves uh, gives black a tremendous advantage. Now, king f2, on the other hand, unpins, and makes it a little bit more difficult. However... I do believe we should still be able to take advantage of this by sacrificing the rook? I feel like this is the kind of sacrifice that you make first and then uh, you calculate it. Okay, I could be wrong on that, but it just seems like such a tempting move because, uh, yeah, I feel like queen a7, putting a little bit of pressure, maybe c5. Further opening up the position. Yeah, I feel like it has to be c5 now. Creating a threat of bishop takes on d4. Um, okay, now this is pretty much more of like an intuitive decision. Or you can call it emotional. Uh, but I think it really gets to show why, uh, um, okay, um, it's so important to have a dark squared bishop. Now notice I can even play queen e5 immediately putting pressure on the dark squares. The only kind of thing that annoys me there is uh, he may be able to just uh, walk home like that. So for this reason, I may consider knight takes first, not being afraid of the pin, uh, because of many things. You pause the video again. <laughs> first of all, we can easily unpin. Second of all, okay, you see a good move, look for better. There is bishop check. We can collect that. Yeah, this is just gonna win a queen. Mark my words. Bishop check. He has to go to e2, which I'm afraid not many people would do. Okay, he finds it. Good. Opponent's got like a good feeling uh, for the possession. Uh, too bad he has a good feeling for a losing possession. Because now I can unpin. First, I don't want to take first because that will mess up the idea because then he can block uh, with a queen. So I want to check him first, forcing the awkward king f1, and only then we're going to pick up the rook, okay? Only then. I'll explain. Because... Come on, opponent, make a move. 
I want to like literally walk you through that once it's on the board. Point is that now if knight takes on c5, I can take saving my own bishop simultaneously. If queen takes, uh, the bishop remains undefended or the knight, uh, which pretty much by magic, okay, by Christmas magic, from being down a rook, okay, or an exchange, to being up a piece, to force resignation, and to get a brilliant win. Simply because you followed my concept and you open up the position when your opponent's king was stuck in the middle of the board, okay? Really, remember this, okay? I don't care. I hope your Christmas is going fine. But if there is anything just related to take away, this concept will uh, really give you uh, just a bunch of effortless wins uh, along your chess careers. And uh, who knows? Maybe some girlfriends too. But we're not going to talk about that now. So, uh, yeah. Should we even run a game review? Are you guys like any skeptical about the accuracy of this game? Don't you feel like this was all calculated and perfect? Well, I don't know who feels that. If maybe for the one percent over there, uh, I'm gonna run a game review. I'm gonna run a game review. And okay, we actually going like a ninety. Who's looking like a clown now? Just for like curiosity's sake. Rook takes on e three was indeed the brilliant move. And just for curiosity's sake. All right, this this one, this was crazy. Oh man, I hate myself for not uh, finding this move. I mean, uh, hopefully you haven't seen it on the screen yet, but it's kind of nice. So you can pause the video again and kind of like hide the solution with your hand. <laughs> uh, by the way, whenever, uh, you know, you used to solve puzzles from books and uh, you're trying to like, uh, you know, check if you uh, had the right move without trying to see the solution. I could never, you know, like read it without like actually looking at the move. So I don't know if it's only me, but that was like the worst format ever for books. So anyways, you could play bishop takes on d4, which I really considered. But my problem was that I only considered this check, but I didn't look for the mate in one. Okay, it's not like he was forced to take the bishop, like he could still try to hide. But it was a move to consider it at least. So I played c5, which is like, you know, very typical to open up the position when his king is, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere like that. And after he took, we just played it very normal. And rook c1 was indeed the final mistake. But it's not like if he plays uh, takes and finds the best defensive move, king e2. It's not like white is having a lot of fun in this game, okay? It's like literally uh, having completely naked king. I can play a simple move, bishop d7, bring the bishop. My bishops are just a powerhouse, okay? You cannot really think of two more lucrative bishops. So, uh, yeah, I just um, cannot stress this enough. One simple concept, okay? Forget about the Karokan. Forget about any opening theory. Okay? King in the middle, you're like decently developed, okay? You have to be decently developed. Don't open up the position when your king is in the middle too. But when you're having decent development, your opponent's king is in the middle. Open up the position. That is just going to give you a tremendous uh, amount of free wins. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. In case you've been waiting to get any of my chessable courses, they are now having some huge holiday discounts. Uh, you even get up to 40% uh, percent, uh, onto the videos. So yeah, give it a try. Money back uh, guaranteed in 30 days if you don't like it. But honestly, they're pretty good. All right, all right, all right. Managed to get ourselves a pretty high rated opponent. Almost um, 1800, it seems, in the high, like, <laughs> 1700s, as you guys like to call it. And I'm uh, going to be going for the Karu. And uh, let's see what uh, life brings us to the table. And life seems to be serving us another exchange variation, which I'm going to be, of course, taking back with a pawn. And we actually get to deal with a pan-off, which is quite fascinating because... 
in kind of like a lot of videos that I have made on the car, we haven't really faced uh, the pun of all that often. I know I even get comments that ask about like a separate video about it, which I haven't really made since. I feel like it's a little bit of a niche variation that doesn't get played very often. But I can tell you pretty much with every single student that I have worked, I noticed that they usually struggle uh, against the pun of in particular. And that happens for a variety of reasons. But in my opinion, by far the biggest issue is that you're not looking at it kind of as an independent line. I mean, okay, <laughs> biggest issue, let me rephrase that, is that, uh, okay, you don't know what the panov really is, <laughs> okay? That is the first problem to begin with. But then the issue is that you normally try to treat it as any other different line. But uh, the problem with bishop g4 is that they have queen b3 and that's kind of hitting uh, two nevralgic spots in your camp. D5 and uh, B7, as you can see here. So, yeah, the pawn is a little hard to pet, and normally I recommend E6. I know what you may be wondering. Okay, this clown telling us to play E6, locking the bishop inside. I don't get uh, how does this make any sense at all. Well, when your opponent pushes pawn to C4, having so much pressure on D5, it really makes sense to uh, play E6. Because later on you can go dc4, once the bishop makes a move, so you are stealing a tempo, wait for him to move somewhere and then you take. And the bishop will be able to create, uh, you know, this fianchiero, and just pretty much occupy a pretty dope diagonal, just by himself. However, my opponent plays cd5, immediately taking, where... I think in my opinion, the best move is to go ed5 and just keep it symmetrical. However, I'm going to be taking with a knight here just to kind of uh, show you the typical ideas uh, behind, um, let's say, playing against the isolated pawn. So, it's pretty simple. Generally, you just want to uh, develop like castle, knight c6, b6, bishop b7, bishop f6, rook c8. The more pieces you trade, the better. And... Uh, Try to pretty much uh, make it to the end game. In the end game, you're just uh, slightly better, simply uh, because of the fact that uh, we have uh, weak pawn to play for. He does start by checking me, <sighs> which you know, there's many ways to block. Probably this is easiest. However, it also means that uh, the game is going to become a little bit dull, a little bit boring. I wonder how bad is it to play king f8. It's probably pretty bad losing the right to castle. I'm just looking at knight c6, knight e5. It's being a little bit annoying. I mean, we'll have to play bishop d7 there and not a disaster. But okay, it is what it is. I'm going to play knight c6. Maybe he doesn't, uh, yeah... Put even more pressure on it, and we get to keep a uh, somewhat healthy pawn structure. We could also throw in knight c3 as a move in general, but I don't think we have to. So I'm just gonna castle. Usually knight c3 is more so improving his pawns, but sometimes if you feel like you could uh, use c3 as a target, definitely this could be a good idea. Uh, and okay. I told you in the past that b6, bishop, b7 is kind of like ideally what we want to do. But that would hang the knight as you correctly pointed out. I'm pretty proud of you. You're improving proving pretty fast. So instead, I'm going to show you the other very important maneuver that is just so nice and juicy in the panel, which is to go bishop f6, making room for the knight so that you can then either play bishop d7, c6 or, uh, well... You could fianchiero, that's fine too, I guess. <laughs> but he just took. Which I don't think is a good move. I mean, there's ED, simple move. But I even like queen takes as it comes with a tempo, sort of attacking uh, two things at once. So, I don't know about you guys, but this is looking like a pretty good pan off. And we have a choice. With a pawn or with a queen. You pause the video and try to think of the best move. 
While taking with the pawn can definitely be very interesting and potentially could set up uh, bishop b7 c5 and just get a great position, it could be more thematic to take with the queen and pretty much just keep everything very clean, okay? Just keep the pawn structure clean. I think normally whenever you can do that, uh, it is usually uh, the right thing. And uh, I'm gonna start with rook d8, just making knight e5 not an option anymore because we can take and... He will be uh, dealing with a big pin. And yeah, keeping the queen on d5, I think it's pretty much uh, what the doctor ordered here. Not afraid of rook c5, I can just uh, go back one step and then b6 regains the tempo. So that is not really a problem. And next up, I'm ready to uh, just set up the battery. And uh, okay, that's, I'm gonna give him, uh, yeah, like a b6 move. I'm not gonna take the hanging rook because I'm sure it was a mouse slip. He wanted to play rook c5. Uh, and that would make the game not interesting. Uh, I'm not interested in such wins, of course. So I'll give him time to uh, move the rook back or whatever. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Probably <laughs> there's some chance he may very well just rage quit, but no, he plays queen c2, uh, continuing in the same plundery fashion because <laughs> now i can do bishop a6 and still take advantage of his mistake i'm not gonna do that just because this kind of randomly happened so i'm gonna play bishop b7 and i'm gonna show you how to slowly squeeze him without like actually taking advantage of a cheap blunder no i want to show you like okay pure strategical uh yeah warfare Basically, if you want to call it that way. Not really a warfare since my opponent is not really punching back here ever. Just because his position is not allowing him to. Uh, he has to just stay passive. Um, defending this pawn. But he plays queen to b3. Do you remember what I, what I told you in the beginning of uh, this game? Of our strategy against the Panov? Well, this is the time to go for the trades and uh, really take advantage of the end game. So trade one, trade two, eliminate the defender of d4, and we just have a free pawn. Come on guys, I told you, it is just this simple. Develop normally, try to go for trades, and then just because uh, he's having an isolated pawn, it's generally gonna be dropping, okay? It's a very tough pawn to uh, defend in the long run. Okay, here we could keep bishop, it's an interesting idea, as pawns on Dallas squares, but uh, also, I think if you go for trades, just prioritizing exchanges, uh, it cannot really be a mistake, so he has to go for the rook trade. We're only up a pawn, but still should give us very good winning chances, and okay, you have to play the following move. You don't even have other candidates, okay? It is super important, so it's a very good moment to test your general uh, chess knowledge, okay? And you have to find this one because even though it is uh, Christmas Eve, I'm going to be punishing you for that, okay? You have a choice. I'm going to give uh, if you, uh, I'm going to even give the moves. H5, make a luft. Rook D1. Or rook d2. Okay? Now, if you played rook d2, congratulations. Um, you have to um, just uh, sort of cut the enemy king on the second and he's never really able to activate. However, if you're in the category of players who thought rook d1 is the move, okay, I have to, okay, I'm sorry. But this way, you're gonna get uh, out of this reflex for uh, <laughs> not um, going for checks whenever you can. This is very important, okay? It's an important lesson that is gonna help you uh, in your journey in the long run, I promise. Or at least that's what they told me. So, uh, B4. I wanna play Rook to A2, making sure that, uh, okay, whenever he tries to do this, I'm gonna have uh, you know, a quick chat with his pawn. Now, because his king is completely tied down forever, we're pretty much going to be playing like having an extra piece. Okay, don't play f6 because you allow pretty much the same. <laughs> you don't want to let him uh, do that. And okay, even g5 is interesting to take space. h4. Uh, 
okay ish move uh, by him. Now this becomes an idea to hunt the pawn. Notice that he cannot defend because that uh, loses a3. It's just a matter of uh, being precise now because this is still an option. I don't want to go h6g5 even though that's uh, kind of a good idea to take space. It's trading his weak pawn which we could potentially win for free. But maybe just this, rook there, take, rook f7, rook e3, rook a7. I mean, there is rook f3, rook b7, rook f4, rook b6, rook h4, rook e6, rook b4. I guess pawn to b6, but then, I mean, because we have the rook behind, it's a winning game, pawn in game, so... I hope you guys uh, calculated that with me. We're just going to be going for it. It does look promising for me, though, I have to say. Uh, usually, uh, rook end game, when you have uh, two connected pass pawns, um, easy win. <laughs> okay, to be honest, kind of like no matter what you play, you're very close to winning here. Just uh, don't flag <laughs> and don't, don't uh, drop your rook. That would also be pretty bad. So, all right, rook c7, we are going for the line that I mentioned. He has to go for counterplay, otherwise I'm just uh, slowly but surely uh, taking h4 pawn and then infiltrating. So, yeah, I was looking onto this and uh, hmm, please king f2, which I wasn't really anticipating. I'm going to give you that. And I think now is just time to save our pawn with a move such as uh, f5. He was indeed lost uh, after rook f7, rook e3, and we also can turn onto this pawn if we ever need to, but uh, yeah, now f5, keeping pawns together, he can never take because it's defended, and this can be met by rook a5. Rook e6, rook b5, two connected passers, same story, just more pawns on the board this time, so... Okay, we have to speed up a little bit. Uh, okay, not, uh, not a lot of time left for this, but... Uh, it should become a little bit intuitive. The only issue is that my king is not in the happiest place ever. <laughs> like the king is almost mated, but uh, not after f4. Because <laughs> I can activate. Man, opponents really makes it easy on me. Uh, that's kind of nice. Do I want to go for it immediately though? I feel like I want to clarify the situation uh, with a b5 pawn first. I feel like there is some uh, unfinished business going on here, uh, you know, like when you're trying to sell uh, an old apartment and still <laughs> some uh, legal bullshit still going on. This is the same, okay? We have to get the papers done. And then we're playing e5. Boom. Go for the trade. Idea to play e4. If we get to push, uh, it's bad. Even if we take, I think it's bad for him because that's going to be another weak pawn. We can check and then infiltrate. Um, yeah, this should be relatively easy conversion right now. I think it's going to be easiest to actually take. I'm going to show you. But if this happens, I have an easy way to scoop up the uh, H pawn. I don't even have to keep uh, the pawn on B6 because um, we get this formation with uh, 3 against uh, 1. <laughs> so... Yeah, two extra pawns. Always easy win. One pawn in the rook end game, not easy, but kind of holdable. Down two pawns, usually just lost. So especially when they are two connected pawns, it's a disaster. So yeah, time to push the pawns. Just need to watch out for his counterplay. I'm going to move the rook from the other side, making room for the pawns. And uh, if he checks me, okay, I'm just going to go back and... Uh, push, try to push them like this. There's many ways to actually convert. I feel like getting pawns like this and king g5 is easiest. But, uh, yeah. Definitely many, many techniques. None of them is wrong here. Uh, check. I'm gonna go there. h4. This move is doing <laughs> actually nothing. I can do g5. Uh, okay, on this plan is to do that. Uh, also, I can try to maybe use this pawn as a bait to get rid of his last pawn. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do king h5. Making room for this. 
So if rook c5, I mean, maybe rook g4, threatening this. Huh, he's trying to come from behind. That's uh, not nice. <laughs> I'm just going to say it's not nice what he's trying to do. I'm going to go rook a3. I think is a good uh, idea. Okay, I'm kind of choking this a little. It's not uh, very clear what I'm doing right now. But essentially, I want to get f4 here. So if he keeps passive position, I'm getting f4. Scooping up the last pawn, making it uh, easy. He has to play probably, yeah, okay, that just... Um, Allows me to infiltrate and then the rest is pretty easy. I can just check him, play g5. Can even play h3. Gonna start with h3. It's kind of funny that uh, his pawn on e3 is actually, uh, you know, <laughs> making it uh, worse for my opponent because I can use it as an umbrella. Okay, I can hide from the checks by using his pawn, which is a little bit ironic, but uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> h2. I don't think he can stop uh, me from promoting and us from having the best uh, Christmas card can. <laughs> so there we go. Made to come. Not a lot to do about it. We can even promote to a rook. Probably we'll just promote to a queen though. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take that and okay. Uh, we got the rook uh, going on with the leather checkmate. That's nice. So key takeaway. Whenever you're dealing with a pan of playing e6 is actually uh, completely okay. And pretty much the big picture is to, uh, yeah, try to develop bishop onto the long diagonal. The more trades, the better. And, uh, yeah, as I told you, generally the end games are just slightly better. Not always like a win by force, but you're never really risking anything. And that's why, uh, okay, if white is not able to get an attack to compensate for the weak pawn, like normally they're dreaming of some kind of attack against our king. If that doesn't happen, by default, you're slightly better against the pan of So... You saw how the game continued, and uh, that was just very easy cleanup and game conversion. Remember Rook D2? He played Rook D1 there. Uh, yeah, I hope a good lesson was learned today. And uh, with that being said, we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody managed to finally get another black game. And my opponent has a very funny nickname. Ich can't focus. Now, based on my uh, basic uh, German knowledge, that means I cannot focus or something like that. Uh, that is pretty much, uh, you know, <laughs> I know five words in German and that is one of them. And okay, enough uh, with the bullshit. We are dealing with a event variation and we're going to be playing very serious from now on to the point where you're not even allowed to smile. Okay, my opponent is playing with c4. What is happening today? Today is the uh, magic day where they just throw in this kind of c4 moves uh, at us. So, here, I would love to just play knight to c6, alright? He's gonna do knight f3. But then, I don't really have a convenient way uh, to develop other than e6. So I'm going to start knight c6 first. Okay, knight f3 and then e6. There is a chance he may uh, play an earlier mistake. Uh, okay, never mind. Knight f3, good move. And yeah, as I was explaining uh, against the pan of game, or perhaps if you see this first, <laughs> let me explain it again. Whenever white plays c4, this is really incentivizing you to go for e6 because when they have so much extra pressure... It is definitely worth it uh, to push simply uh, because, uh, well, uh, 
yeah, now we have better control uh, over the center. And in some variations, uh, yeah, as explained after the takes, the bishop could develop this way. Not exactly in this variation, but uh, you get the point. I think e6 also is quite nice against this particular variation because, uh, well, uh, yeah, if you start cd4, I believe there is uh, cd5 as a move. If you go queen d5, knight c3 can be quite annoying. So that's, uh, you know, a little detail to be aware of. Against this, I think we're just going to be recapturing with the pawn. It's already uh, way more convenient to uh, develop than before. Because, uh, yeah, we just notice how he no longer has any pressure whatsoever on d5. So it's a little bit of a weird position, I have to admit. Queen a5 doesn't do much because of knight c3. And I would be tempted to just play bishop to g4. With the idea to, you know, maybe take, take on d4. I think that's pretty solid. Knight d2 could be a very funny blunder. With the idea that after bishop takes, knight takes. And he keeps a knight on f3. <laughs> but in that position I have queen a5 check. Winning the bishop because he no longer can block with a knight. Which is pretty funny and lots of people forget about. Now when they take, you don't really have a choice uh, other than recapturing. And uh, he plays bishop e3. Now... Especially for low-rated games, I expect uh, bishop g5 quite a lot. So, you pause the video and tell me why is that actually a losing move. And spoiler alert, it is not bishop e7. That is not the best move. Okay, on bishop g5. Queen g5 is fancy, but not as efficient. That's just a trade. Bishop g5, gotta take the knight, eliminate the defender. If they retake, bishop is free. If they take your queen, you take theirs. Both bishops die, but you end up with an extra piece. So for this reason, he plays bishop to e3, just kind of like, you know, defending his center, putting a bit of pressure on c5. And now, I could do knight e7, I could do queen b6. Develop and attack. Knight d7, dc5. The point is to go knight to f5. Which I really seem to like. <laughs> I'm gonna do this just because normally uh, pretty much engaging into such an early risky queen journey. Um, even if, uh, you know, you manage to win a pawn. I just think like the risk reward ratio is, uh, is not enough. Okay, it's like, um, imagine you're having a bag of Skittles, okay? And uh, only one of them, um, if you eat it, can potentially kill you. Dude, don't tell me you're gonna be touching the bag of Skittles. Like, this is uh, generally the same in these kind of positions in the Karo Khan. Uh, the risk is just too big to, like, rely on such things. So, okay, h3. Normally, I have this rule that always in the uh, advanced variation, uh, it's good to take on f3. I think here it's good. I'm just kind of wondering if it's the best. Mm, it's a bit of a weird position, so uh, yeah, harder to play just by template rules because center kind of exploded and many uh, <laughs> yeah changes have uh, been happening for the last couple of moves in case you haven't been paying attention to the games uh, <laughs> and you're just watching home alone in the same time and you have me on uh, like a second monitor or something uh, yeah I could do that the only problem is that I would really love to play knight f5 which doesn't seem to be an option if uh, I start by take so I would love this and then knight f5 the only question is, can he go g4 and then dc5? Ah, perhaps that's annoying, so that's why I'm gonna start by takes. This decision was pretty much uh, made by elimination and... Okay, perhaps now queen b6 makes sense. Because dc5, I have a direct threat of queen b2 winning the rook. So queen b6 forcing him to castle, I guess. But then I got cd4 winning a clean pawn. So, this time... My main card is that we're not even going to get to the point where we take that pawn on b2. We just play queen to b6 because we're winning the pawn on d4 by force. 
Okay, do not confuse it with the queen journey argument that I just uh, said five seconds ago, okay? This is actually a different idea because uh, his rook is like no longer defended by the queen. Like in the previous line, this was not so threatening. Now, if I get to play this next move, we just pretty much win. If queen b2 happens winning the rook, we end the game. Pretty much. Um, so yeah, in order to defend, I think he has to castle. So that queen b2, there's knight e2. Even that doesn't look amazing. But yeah, move like b3, I was guessing it's required. But f c d4 and ich kann focus might be in trouble. So yeah, as simple as that. Uh, sticking with the rules. Managed to get a free pawn. Now the only thing that's left, we need to finish development. So... In order to do so, we need to activate this bishop and uh, we need to move the knight first. Where do you go? F5 or G6? You pause the video and give me the answer. Which one is better? If you think, let's say, according to what we normally see, knight goes to F5 just fine. But you always want to ask yourself about uh, pieces and their utility. Knight on G6, targeting bishop, targeting pawn way more utility than on f5 so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight uh, about how i'm coming up with this moves i mean it would be kind of awkward to watch one hour long videos and <laughs> you don't get any insights <laughs> i don't know why would you do that so um okay we're castling in a very insightful way getting our king to safety uh, rook c1, I'm just gonna play, uh, okay, I, I would love to play c5, but that would leave the pawn undefended. I would love to do this so that the pawn is nicely protected. And I think I'm gonna start with this move. Protecting, and then we can push. Notice that I'm keeping this rook to support a5, a4. Because the pawn on b3 can really be a hook. Now queen g4, the only goal of this move could be potentially to push e6. And the thing is, it would be really nice to maneuver the knight to e6, but just imagine he may move the bishop, push f4, f5, and the knight ends up being uh, more of a target, if anything. So I don't think it's uh, worth the time and just to kind of defend against e6. You have to get used of this idea, c5. You can defend uh, pretty much squares by uh, discovery, okay? This is a concept that a lot of beginners, they don't even uh, consider this as possible. And it's not like it's difficult. Just for some reason, people tend to have a blind spot for ideas like this, okay? You need to defend e6 square. You can do so like this. People somehow consider only a move like that. I mean, it's a knight backward move, so let's not push it, but... <laughs> You get where I'm going with this. So, uh, yeah. Knight f3, I'm gonna go queen trade. Cut the extra pawn. I'm gonna try to get uh, the queens off, which should normally uh, facilitate uh, the conversion, if I have to speak using big words. <laughs> so, queen to e6. Normally, in any world, he should keep queens on the board, like, uh, for the price of his life. Because any endgame down upon, very uh, big chances to lose. Goes there. I can go queen f5, forcing bishop d2. I don't really see a follow-up yet, so I think it's time to pretty much go a5, a4. I feel like my pieces are on optimal squares apart from the queen side. And uh, as a matter of fact, we only have uh, 90 seconds left, so I'll have to really speed up. Knight there. I think we take, chop it off, bishop g5, okay, queen g5, never mind. We can chop, bishop not so scary. Let's do the chop, let's keep it simple and... Uh... Oh, by the way, now that I chopped, uh, let's not forget my pawn is uh, in desperate need of protection. 
You gotta do that first. Uh, it's very easy to forget, especially for beginners. Like when one uh, thing is defended for like so many moves, like it was the case with opponent C5, you can pretty much get like tattooed in your brain. Uh, <laughs> okay, th this is never vulnerable, which is not the case. So I'm pretty much playing A4 now, idea to take and then uh, have a fresh weakness to attack. Um, so yeah, that is gonna be a very juicy pawn right there. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> it's up to opponent to do something. The nice thing is that uh, after B A4, Rook A4, I don't have any issues with the pin, like Rook D4, I can take because there are no tricks since my rook is defended, so he cannot uh, do any combinations trying to get the back ranker. So, yeah, okay, we're going for that. Let's see if he's gonna try it. Rook d4, it kind of, you know, feels like there should be something going on, but I think we have it all under control. Or at least I hope, I'm hoping so. Uh, nevertheless, I'm gonna make a luft pretty soon. I think h6 is nice. I'm not doing g6 because just in some hypothetical scenario there are these famous perpetuals uh, like this. If he, his queen can infiltrate. So yeah, I'm gonna do h6. Next up, uh, well, I don't wanna lose uh, the c pawn, but I'm considering all his ideas uh, like that. <sighs> queen to g3. Uh, okay. Mm. I'm gonna do queen e7, I think. Having this defended, so we can play there. I could have also started rook c4 as a nice maneuver. It perhaps would have been a better move. But at this point, gotta speed up. That's all we need to do. Offering rook trade. Thank you for improving my bonds, opponent. That is very kind. Appreciate that. I mean, just imagine we get rid of the queens, like f5, queen g5. Okay, queen f3. Gotta watch out for the rook. Maybe once queen d5 as well. Gotta make a move. Rook on the open file seems natural. Or at least natural enough. So... Okay. What are the odds uh, the game will end with... Uh, Queen takes on d2, checkmate. I'm gonna go here. Making a silent threat. Just a very silent threat. And I call it. Queen takes on d2, checkmate. Let's see. Is my prediction gonna be right? Because I am threatening rook b1 check. In order to deal with it, he has to go rook d1. But then, I mean, I can, at the very least, pick up f4 pawn. I can also go rook b2. Yeah, that's a bit of a better move, I guess, but still not solving the issues, so... Start by taking, threatening mate in one. Has to go rook e1, but then I have rook b2, so... Yeah, there we go. Rook to b1 and uh, finish to get the job done. After a pretty weird start, a pretty weird game, I have to say, but this specific variation can get you in trouble immediately, okay? Like, you have no idea how many beginners I see get completely rolled over by this variation after, let's say, knight c6, knight f3. They don't know what to do and they play dc4. I'm not kidding, this is very common. Allowing d5 and then, oh, they have to move the knight. There's bishop coming and... You just cannot play the game, white is completely winning already thanks to strong center, strong pieces, it's like plus two already, so incredibly dangerous line, okay? Pretty rare, but super dangerous, but here we uh, get to highlight the typical rule that I like to use, okay? The way I design my repertoire and uh, how I like to coach the Karo Khan, I have this kind of typical rules that um, if you like really understand them and remember, you can easily apply them in many variations. So c4, when white pushes that pawn, as I told you, kind of controversially, you can play e6 lock in the bishop. That is fine. Just kind of annihilate their pressure in the center. And you guys are probably wondering what the game review looks like. 
We got only like a 72, dude. Are you completely crazy? On Christmas Eve. Chess.com coach is calling this a clown fiesta. Dude, I, 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 I don't get it. Okay, Bishop F3 was best. Clearly better after this. Okay, I think opening was pretty flawless. It's just some shady business uh, might have been going on into the middle game. I mean, the end game, I meant to say. But that's the thing that I notice sometimes, okay? Like, I recently had a game on my main account. I was just, like, proud. I got three brilliant moves. I thought that's one of the best games that I played in a while. Coach gave me, like, 78. I just think that sometimes it's not accurate, okay? They just felt like a very solid game overall. Like, even the finish was pretty smooth. Like, even if he defends here against mate, I mean, I would have gone probably rook b2 and threatening, uh, you know, some... Infiltration going on, uh, but yeah, there you go, guys. Uh, in case you were looking to have a guide, I guess it's somewhat rare, but very, very dangerous. Okay, I cannot stress this enough. Remember this idea and play e6, cd5. I think we took the right way, uh, ed, because taking it with the queen would allow knight c3 and uh. This is another uh, problematic line. Allowing this d5 push is just so annoying, you have no idea. Uh, like if you just take, there is like almost virtually no way to stop the fork. It gets bad, bad. So follow my instruction. Go e6 there. Take it with the uh, pawn and uh, okay, even though it looks a little bit scary, it should uh, definitely be uh, all good. So. With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Hey there! Thanks for making it this far into the video. And I just wanted to let you know that me and Mickey Mouse from my t-shirt are wishing you happy holidays.